put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Let me introduce you to my friend Francois Duplessis, who has a keen interest in archaeology. He's going to talk about Nebuchadnezzar again today. The whole truth about Nebuchadnezzar, the man who actually got to write a little piece of the Bible. Francois. Thank you, Walter. This is a tremendous research. I'm only going to give you a fraction of it. The name, the throne name of this man, Nabu Kuduri Usa, means Nabu, the king, God, Nabu. Kuduri, the boundary stone, and Usur. It means the God Nabu protects my boundaries. He had faith in his God. I was searching for inscriptions concerning this great man. I went to a place called Nar el Kelp. Nar means river and Kelp means dark in Lebanon. I was disappointed. I searched there for many years. I got Esar Hadon, I got Tutmosis III and a few other uh, rulers of antiquity, but I couldn't find anything about Nebuchadnezzar. But I kept on searching. And eventually I found it. Just look at this. An inscription from the king himself. It was quite a job, remember, getting down there, clearing the bushes, and eventually we saw this inscription. It gave me such a thrill. The Bible is true, and perseverance is the master of defeat. You know, Walter, I like to discover facts about biblical characters because it strengthens my faith in the Word of God. Now, Daniel and Jeremiah, both these prophets, predicted that he would become a world ruler. And let's quickly look at the archaeology and the history of the rising of this great man. By the way, this is the procession way on which Daniel walked. It says in Daniel 4.30, The king spoke and said, Is this not the great Babylon that I've built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? It was a magnificent city. He was so proud about this. He developed megalomani eventually. Well, I went to Nineveh. You can see it on the screen. And this is where he and his father, Nabopolassa, with the king of Ekbatana called Saacheres, destroyed the city in 612. As the Bible predicted, he became a world ruler. Then you and I went to Karkemesh, where Nebuchadnezzar defeated the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho II, it was a terrible defeat. He was becoming stronger and stronger. And then we went to Wadi Briza. We stood there and there's a tremendous statement of Nebuchadnezzar about his greatness. Just look at the inscriptions here. I was so thrilled when I saw this. Let me read to you what he said, Walter. I have made the city of Babylon the foremost among all the countries and every human habitation. It sounds like Daniel chapter 4. He's a great man. Its name I have made or elevated to the most worthy of praise among the sacred cities. The big I am, the king of Babylon. I visited the foundation of the Etamanaki, the ancient tower of Babylon. Etamanaki means the foundation stone of heaven and earth. Here at the Esa Gilad was a great complex like the Vatican. People of the world worshipped here. And this is where he restored the great Etamanaki. This is how he prayed. He believed in salvation by works. What he says, O Marduk, my Lord, do remember my deeds favorably as good deeds, May these, my good deeds, be always before your mind. Salvation by works. So that my walking in Esagila and Esida, which I love, may last to old age. You know, I looked at an original stone from the time of Nebuchadnezzar. There you can read his boastful words in stone. Daniel 4.34 says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. He developed megalomania. He became too great and something happened and he ate 
grass, boantrophy they call it. Eventually this great king looked up and his mind came back. We need to look up, Walter, to God and not to ourselves. I took a picture of you here, Walter, in the Berlin Pergamon Museum. Daniel 4.34 says, After he looked up, Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. If we look up, we'll praise God. If we look down, we'll praise ourselves. May God help us to behold him and become changed. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. The whole truth is very elusive, and sometimes we have to dig for it. Like Francois Duplessis dug in the sands of time, so we're going to dig in the annals of science to see whether we can find a solution to this problem plaguing humanity. Where do we come from? Now, Charles Darwin knew nothing about genes. He didn't have any knowledge of the genetic system because the science of genetics was not known in his time. Gregor Mendel had done his work, but as for Darwin, he knew nothing of it because it was lying in some dust, in some monastery. So what are the genes of Genesis? Where do we come from? How do we account for change over time? This was Charles Darwin at the time that he accepted the position of ship's naturalist on the Beagle. He was a young man. He was a very intelligent man. He had theological training. He was a naturalist. And he had the good fortune of marrying a very rich lady, which gave him time for leisure. And so he took the post on the Beagle and sailed around the world, particularly to map South America, and to make naturalistic notes. And this is the trip that changed his life. Because on that trip he took with him a book which he got from a friend of his called Charles Lyell. I don't know what it is with all these Charleses, but anyway, Charles Lyell wrote The Principles of Geology. And in The Principles of Geology he expounds the possibility that the layers that we find in the geological strata in the world out there, represent millions of years of time. Of course, Charles Darwin's grandfather also had evolutionary ideas, which, by the way, are not new. They date back to the time of the Greeks. They're actually a Greek philosophy expounded by philosophers such as Aristotle. Now, Darwin was actually quite a meek and mild man. And uh, here in the museum, in the Museum of Natural History in Great Britain, you see his uh, friend or his defender sitting right next to him. And uh, this is Huxley. And Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. He fought the battles for him. And he's the one that, uh, in adverted commas, won the debate with the bishops of the then time world, Wilberforce, and he didn't win it on the basis of facts. He won it on the basis of attitude, which is an important lesson for us. We should be careful how we react to people. Well, here is the, the map of the voyage of the Beagle. And Charles Darwin, on his travels around South America, eventually ended up here in the Galapagos Islands. And on the Galapagos Islands, he saw many things which puzzled him, and which, quite honestly, would puzzle any thinking individual. One of the things that he saw that really surprised him was the variety of finches which he saw on the islands. Now, the finch takes the place on these islands in terms of variety and adaptability to what the songbirds would do on the mainland. And when he looked at these finches and he saw some with the large beaks, which they, which they could crack open uh, huge seeds, some with smaller beaks, some would eat insects, some would eat uh, cacti, and uh, they all seemed to fill various niches. And the idea came to him, well, if the finches show this remarkable variety here on these islands, 
then maybe they had a common ancestor. And if they had a common ancestor, then they weren't created individually, immutably, as the world then saw the creation account. You see, scientists had a mindset that uh, God had created each individual unchangeable, immutable, by individual acts of his power. And there was no room for any digression from this, any change over a period of time. Now, people like Linnaeus, for example, had classified the animals and used the binomial nomenclature to classify all the various species into the generic and specific names. And each one individually was considered to have been created by God by an individual act. And now Charles Darwin sees this and he says to himself, now hang on a second, isn't it possible that these finches all derived from a common ancestor and this was a reflection of change over time? Now where does that leave fiat creation? Well, Charles Darwin came to the conclusion that God did not create. And he took the baby and he threw it out with the bathwater. Actually, what he should have done, he should have said, Well, isn't it possible that God didn't create immutable, unchangeable, but that he built in a tremendous variety and a potential for change within certain parameters, which he defined as a kind? Isn't that a possibility? Rather than taking the atheistic view and say, well, if there is change, then there is no God, because that's where science is today. I was once brought before a commission of inquiry, because I used to be an evolutionist and I changed to become a creationist. And in my university career, I was brought before this commission of inquiry with the accusation by one of my colleagues that you cannot believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. So this is not conjecture. This is a real problem in the world out there. So let's have a look at this issue and ask ourselves, did these finches have a common ancestor, which is logical, or were they created individually by fiat creation. My personal view is in perfect line with Darwin, but where do you draw the limits to this discussion? As we said before, Darwin knew nothing about genetics. He didn't know what the genetic material uh, looked like. He didn't know how to transmit information. He just realized that there were features which changed over time. Now, this is the DNA molecule as we know it today. Um, magical molecule with all the information encoded in its molecules as to who and what we are. And every single species has its particular blueprint of DNA. Now this information is like the information in the pages of a book. As itself and by itself it means nothing, just like a book standing on a shelf cannot do anything. This information has to be read, this information has to be decoded, and this information has to be transcribed into something else that becomes tangible and real. The question is, where did this DNA molecule come from? How did it evolve? And if so, how did it make it possible for all the varieties of life forms which we have on the planet? Now here is the molecule of DNA, very uh, simple molecule actually, highly complex generally speaking, but in terms of its components, it's not very complex. It has a sugar, which is deoxyribose, and it has four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. It has phosphorus in it, and in the sequence in which these bases are arranged, we have the message encoded. Now the DNA code works in what we call a triplet code. Three letters coding for a particular amino acid. So as these letters are read in the DNA sequence, the information is transcribed into placing molecules of amino acids in the right sequence in a protein, thus creating an enzyme or a structural protein which can then eventually produce all the effects required for what we call life and structure. 
So where did this molecule come from? How did it come together in the first place? Well, here science has to admit that it had to take place by chance. So the molecule had to assemble by chance. There is no selective advantage in producing uh, the molecule because the molecule in itself doesn't do anything. It's just a container of information, just like a book cannot construct an aeroplane. So this information somehow has to come together by chance. You know all the conjectures that they use. How long would it take for a, a bunch of monkeys to type the entire Encyclopedia Britannica? Well, that's where the millions of years come in. You need huge quantities of time in order to make this scenario possible. But even then, you still run into major snags. Now, the bases have to come into a particular sequence to make any sense. And uh, we're dealing with the science of probabilities. Where did the molecules come from in the first place to create this uh, super molecule and all the other molecules which are necessary for life? Well, experiments that Stanley Miller conducted seem to indicate that if you take a primitive atmosphere and you put it in a bowl and you have methane and ammonia and hydrogen and uh, gases of an inert nature in there without any oxidizing uh, gases whatsoever, and you pass some sparks through it, simulating thunderstorms, well, then you get organic molecules. But of course, you only get them if you entrap them. If they stay where they were, the very next spark or the very next millisecond would destroy them again, so they could never accumulate. So you have all kinds of problems in getting these molecules to form. To get all the molecules of life to form, like the amino acids and the sugars and all of these various components, you need totally different environmental circumstances. For example, if you want amino acids, you need the nitrogen, which you have to convert to, to all kinds of components in order to get that particular molecule. If you want to make a nucleotide, you'd have to change the nitrogen into something else, like hydrogen cyanide, to get that particular molecule. If you wanted to have the sugars, you have no need of the nitrogens of the ammonias whatsoever, so they are clashing. Uh, components involved in creating the molecules of life in the first place. So highly improbable that it could ever have happened on this, on this earth. And that's why you have even the conjecture of what they call panspermia, that maybe it happened out there in space. Well, that's just transposing the problem. You can't solve it here, so project it into space. It doesn't solve the problem either. Well, the primitive earth must have had a reducing atmosphere. All scientists agree with that. Hydrogen, ammonia, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrogen, and then water. And if you had any oxygen, as in the present atmosphere where you have oxygen, well, then these molecules would never come together because the oxidation process would destroy them. So here you have another misnomer. If you have oxygen, you cannot get the production of these molecules by chance. Here's the problem. If you have water, you have oxygen. Because the ozone layer is what protects the world from irradiation and bombardment from outer space. Without oxygen, no ozone. No ozone, water would dissociate and form oxygen and water, so you would have, or an hydrogen, so you would have oxygen from the beginning. There wouldn't have been a reducing atmosphere ever if you have water, but you need water to have life. So there are many, many problems associated with the production of the molecules of life in the first place. What is the probability of just one simple gene coding for just a few amino acids in the right sequence coming about by chance? Well, if you placed a bomb under a pile of wood and you exploded the bomb and boom! At the end process you had a little house, fully functional. What would be the probability of that happening? Well. The probability is actually mind-boggling. Now, science has a particular scenario about the number of particles in the entire universe. In other words, subatomic particles, how many are there in the universe? Well, the probability of it happening is probably greater than 1 in 10 to the power of 80. Now, 10 to the power of 80 is the number that physicists tend to use for the number of particles in the entire universe. And the probability of your explosion producing the little house 
is in excess of that, 1 in 10 to the power of 80, probably much greater than that. So for all intents and purposes, zero. But it happens, they say, so it must have uh, happened so. so. That's how some of the top scientists argue on this issue. Now, once the genes had actually formed, and let's, let's say, for the sake of argument, that by chance they all came together and did, by chance, create the messages which are necessary for life, then it's still just a message in the writings of a page. Now, I want to discuss two little words. The one is genotype, and the other one is phenotype. Now, what is a genotype? A genotype is all the genes that are present in a fertilized egg, in the zygote. And the phenotype is that which actually is expressed. There are far more genes in a gene pool than that which is actually expressed. So what you see today, when you are looking at me through this television lens, what you are seeing is my phenotype. There are far more genes in my genotype than are expressed in my phenotype. Now there's a law in science that natural selection operates at the level of the phenotype not the level of the genotype. Now that's perfectly logical. Natural selection implies the survival of the fittest to the detriment of the non-fit. So when you have two possibilities, the one that is better adapted physically, phenotypically, is the one that has a higher probability of surviving. So everything that happens at the level of the genotype happens by chance through mutation. So genotype change takes place by chance. So you have to have a positive mutation somewhere along the line which is to be expressed in the phenotype before natural selection can work on it. Now science uses examples of positive mutations. For example, sickle cell anemia is the textbook classic. Now this is a scenario where red blood corpuscles don't have the normal shape, but are sickle shaped, which means they don't bind with oxygen as readily as the normal one. So people with sickle cell anemia are actually sick. They are diseased. But in a malaria environment, they have a selective advantage because the malaria parasite cannot penetrate those corpuscles, and therefore they tend to not get malaria. And that is seen as a, as a positive mutation. Please, that's not a positive mutation. It's a negative mutation. Sickle cell anemia is a disease. There is nothing positive about sickle cell anemia. It's just positive and relative to a greater disease. So there is really no scenario for a positive mutation. But you would have to have them accumulating over time in order to account for possible positive change. So the genotype consists of all the genes in my genetic makeup. The phenotype is what I actually look like. Now, imagine two individuals walking around in uh, the Kruger National Park, which has lions and wild animals in it. And the one individual is lean and mean. That would be his phenotype. The other one is short and plump. That's another phenotype. Now, when confronted with a lion, which one has the greater probability of surviving? Obviously, the lean and mean one. So the moral of the story is always to take someone short and plump with you when you go walking in any of those areas. The moral of the story really is that the genotype is not consulted by the lion. The phenotype is the one that determines whether you survive or whether you don't. So chance is the watchword at the level of change at the genotype and selection comes in where the phenotype is there. Now, did selection produce anything? No. You would still have to have the phenotype come about by chance before selection can take place. In other words, natural selection is not a good creator. It's not a creator at all. It doesn't create anything. 
So whether you use science and evolution by natural selection, or whether you use creation, the first phenotype still had to come about by chance. What does that mean about the genotype? The entire genotype has to come about by chance. Now that boggles the mind. The probability of just one gene coming about by chance is boom, little house. What about the myriads and myriads of genes which comprise our genotype? What do we have then? Boom, little house, boom, little house, boom, little house, boom, little house, boom, little house. In other words, you have to have a measure of faith which boggles the mind. Now that's fair enough. But then let's argue from the level where we have to argue. If faith is the watchword, then call it faith. Don't call it science. You have to have faith to believe in evolution. You have to have faith to believe in God. Both start at the same starting point. So the genotype is the book of instructions as to who and what each species on this planet is. What it is to look like and how it is to function. The phenotype is the end product of the story. The actual transposition of what is in the genotype to the physical object. Now here is my question. If the genotype is the book of instructions and has to come about by chance, then who wrote the book? You have two choices. The book was written by the God of Chance, or the book was written by the author of Genesis. And that is your choice today. You either believe in creation by chance, or you believe in creation by the God of the universe. So here I have a book, and let's assume chance wrote the book. So the book came about by chance. Now all I have to do, I mean this book contains all the information as to who and what you are. Well, let's simplify it, as in the case of our slide, where we had uh, a book and an aeroplane. If this book contains all the information for the aeroplane that I have on the screen over there, well then that's wonderful. It came about by chance. Let's put the book on the shelf, and now let's wait for the aeroplane to appear. How long will I wait? I will wait forever because the information has to be transcribed before I can have the aeroplane. So let's get to the point where we actually have the aeroplane. Once I have the aeroplane, well then selection can come into place. Does this aeroplane fly or does it not fly? But what about the process from the book to the aeroplane? How did that come into existence? It had to come about by? Well, chance. Because it's not subject to natural selection. Only the phenotype is subject to natural selection, not the process that produces the phenotype. So the information plus the process to produce the phenotype has to come about by chance. The probability of it happening is so mind-boggling remote that you might as well forget it. Here we have the process that actually takes place within the cell. You have your information encoded in the DNA. The DNA has to be unraveled, in other words, opened up as you would open the pages in a book. And then that's not enough. You have to read it. There are enzymes which read it and then transcribe it, make a photocopy, as it were, into a molecule called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus of the cell and attaches itself to a structure known as the ribosome. This is a, a decoder. It actually takes that message and then creates a molecule of protein exactly according to the instructions in that particular piece of messenger RNA. Now this process is highly complex and any mistake in the transcription would result in an error in the final product. How did this immensely complex situation come into existence? You have two choices, chance or design. Now in my mind, this is design and it smacks of a designer. 
It is so intricate, it is so complex, that it takes the scientific minds and geniuses of the combined world to still not comprehend what's going on in this process. We explain it to the students at the university level and they struggle to comprehend its complexity and we do not even understand a fraction of what's going on. And we believe it came about by chance. It's the genotype and the transcription of genotype. It's not the end product. Choose thee for yourselves which you would prefer to believe. That a designer designed this or that chance created it. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. We were talking about creation versus evolution. And we asked the, the question, whether a designer fits the scenario or whether the God of chance fits the scenario. There's another problem that we have to face when we look at this creation by natural selection, if you were, and that's the problem of irreducible complexity. How does natural selection produce something that cannot operate in incremental improvements? In other words, the full thing has to be there before it can function. For example, if you look at the renal corpuscles and you look at the structure of the loop of Henle, which enables the kidney to uh, produce a concentrated urine, this, the scenario will only work once the anatomical configuration is perfect in every detail. The same with the flagellum at the cellular level. It can only turn and operate once it is in its complete form. In other words, there is no incremental improvement over time that can take place. Natural selection cannot slowly advance the structure until it finally operates. It has to be complete. Again, you have the problem. What created it? Chance or design? Some of these structures are so complex that it boggles the mind, more complex than anything that was ever put into space. How did such a thing come about by chance? You know, natural selection is made out to be the creator god of all things in the scientific fraternity. Natural selection creates zilch, nothing. It can only select between options that are already here. And here's another problem. If natural selection is the one that produces more and more and more and more and more and more over time, then how do you calculate this issue because selection implies the survival of one to the detriment of the other. In other words, survival of the fit, fitness and the extinction of the non-fit. Now two minus one is what? In my mathematics it's one. So here you have a mathematical misnomer. How does natural selection, a process that produces less and less, create more and more? It doesn't make any sense. Natural selection is a useless creator. Well, scientists says we get change through mutation. Now mutations are normally negative. You can have additions, like here we have an addition of a, of a base in the DNA molecule, or we could have a deletion. But additions or deletions in triplet codes tend to wreak havoc. For example, if we have a sentence, the cat and the hat, and we delete a C, it would read the atat at the hundat to the at, which is complete gibberish. So mutations tend to be negative, and even the so-called positive ones tend to be negative. So how do we get mega change? How do we get the evolution of the simple to the complex? How do we get to the evolution of the muscle cell? How do we get to the evolution of the nerve cell? After all, if evolutionary processes managed to produce the first little primitive cell, it didn't have a muscle cell, it didn't have a nerve cell, it didn't have an epithelial cell, it didn't have all the myriads of cell types that work in coordination with one another. And the process of chance produced them in the first place? Well, let's just have a look at the scenario 
of developing just these two types of cells from an original basic information of DNA coding for a simple singular celled organism. How do you get both of these together? Well, you need quite a few genes that are involved in this process. A muscle cell will have a whole plethora of structural genes which say you are a muscle cell. And a nerve cell will have a whole plethora of structural genes saying you are a nerve cell. Now those genes would have to come about by chance because it's a genotype. Boom little house, boom little house, boom little house, boom little house. You need a lot of faith for that. But the problem gets worse. Once you have two types of cells in the same organism, then you have to have some mechanism to switch between the one set of codes and the other set of codes. So you need promoter genes or switching genes. Where do they come from? They weren't necessary in the first scenario, which just had one variable. So it had to come about by chance. Again, each activating gene, boom, little house. Well, your faith has to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the probabilities become so mind-boggling they become unbelievable, but even that is not enough. Not only do you need structural genes and promoter genes, you need genes controlling the physiology, genes controlling the embryology, so that these actually start working together. How did that come to, to be? Remember, it cannot be incremental, it actually has to work. In other words, the phenotype has to be in place. You have to make a choice between chance and design. And here is a mega problem. Whether we look at the birds of the world today, whether we look at the mammals, or whether we look at the spiders, or whether we look at simple sponges, or there's no such thing as a simple sponge, it's highly complex, flatworms, or the protista, or any one of the creatures out there in the world, all of them, in order to qualify as living beings need a highly complex physiology. They all need the highly complicated processes which enable them to live. They all need a Krebs cycle. They all have them. They all need a glycolysis system. They all have them. They all need all the gene systems in place to create the amino acids which constitute their very makeup. They all have them. From the very advanced to the so-called very primitive, they all have them. Now here's the problem. If they all had them, and even the most primitive has them, then what? Then they must have been there from the beginning. In other words, all those highly complex processes shared by all the various creatures on the planet were there from the very beginning and had to come about by either chance or design. Or else you would have to speculate that they evolved individually over and over and over again to fulfill the same criteria. Highly improbable. That's why we share a mega load of genes. But that doesn't make us similar. Because the way those genes are expressed by all the different activating and deactivating genes and how long they are expressed determines who and what we are. So to say that we have the same amount or number of genes as a monkey doesn't make us a monkey. Definitely not. It's much more complicated than that. As I've said, selection requires more than one variant. So not only does natural selection have to produce the phenotype, it has to produce more than one or else you can't have selection. How do you want to choose one out of one? It makes no sense. You need two. So again, you have to double up your boom little houses. Now the example that is used in the world is the pepper moth. This is of course unfair because it never really existed like this. This is a staged scenario where they stuck them onto the trees as a probable way in which it happened. So a light one on a light background and a dark one on the light background, the dark one would stand out. If you reversed it, the black one would have a selective advantage and this is how they demonstrate natural selection. Again, one minus one is zero. 2 minus 1 is 1. Natural selection doesn't produce anything. It eliminates. It's a very poor creator. So what about the gene pool that we have in the dog? I mean, look at this gene pool. It's amazing. You have anything from the Chihuahua to the Great Dane within the wild type, the wolf type. All those possibilities are there. Although they're not expressed. Once you start digging, 
in, in this wild type gene pool, what can you dig up with? You can dig up a chihuahua, or a dachshund, or a German shepherd, or a whippet. What type of ear types do we dig up? All kinds of ear types. We can have bloodhound ears, collie ears, papillon ears, bull terrier ears, fluffy ears, non-fluffy ears. Those gene variables, where were they? They were all there, potentially available for use. How did they come into existence? Genotype? Genotype? How did they come into existence? Chance or design? Your only possibility. So come, you can't argue evolutionary processes here. So they were all built in there. So maybe the God of chance was so kind as to produce boom little house, boom little house, boom little house in excess of all the needs of the organism and put them right there. Or else the designer put them there to meet every eventuality. That sounds more logical to me. So here we have a fall variety and a spring variety of ladybirds. Initially people would class them as two species. But now we know that in the one set of environmental circumstances, one set of genes is activated, and in another set a different tune is played on the same piano. It's still piano music, but it's two tunes. Two different organisms, built-in variety in the gene pool. Well, what about that variety? Built-in variety in the gene pool. Now, if natural selection is such a poor creator of gene pool material, then how do they account for this tremendous increase in variability over time? Well, one of the methods that science employs is to say that fertilization increases the variety and that's where it comes from. But here's another misnomer. Where did fertilization come from? Because fertilization requires two individuals that are different. Secondly, it requires a process of reduction genetics called meiosis to produce a germ cell. Now that process is so complex, like any biologist will tell you, that it boggles the mind. Yet it in itself doesn't produce anything. It's still at the level of the gene, it's genotype. It's only the offspring's variety that eventually shows this variability. So this process, male and female, how did it come about? By itself, it doesn't produce any variability unless they come together in a positive, productive capacity. So male and female, where they come from? Science would have to conjecture that this somehow happened sometime in the past by chance. Boom! Empire State Building. Forget about the little house. And then it gets worse. Came about by chance. They had to have the anatomical configurations in order to exchange the material, which would have to be reduced in order to make it normal again in the final analysis. All of that by chance. You don't have any phenotype variant yet until you have the children. Mega, mega problem. The Bible says God created them, male and female. Now that makes sense. We had this exchange of genetic material in the meiotic process. The chromosomes of the father and the mother come together and uh, then they exchange genetic material. So you have crossing overs taking place, precise crossings over. In other words, the gene is cut at precisely the right level cross attached to the opposite uh, member and then loosened again many, many, many times over. One little mistake, just write it, cut it one genotype or one nucleotide too far and the sentence would read total senseless gibberish. So where did this process of crossing over and exchange of genetic material to produce variability come from its genotype, it had to happen by chance or design. Take your pick. It's so complicated, the greatest minds in the world still don't understand it, but we believe it came about by chance in the scientific world. Well, here you have a species that doesn't have eyes. So it's a new species. Is it a new species? 
Or is it just the fish that grew up in a cave and the stimulus for the development of the eyes is not activated and the eye does not develop? Isn't the gene for the eyes still latent in the creature? Yes or no? Or is this evolution in process? You have blind cave crayfish, blind cave beetles, blind cave salamanders, blind cave cockroaches. In Hawaii, when the cockroaches invade new islands that form, within eight months they are eyeless. Is this evolution? No. It's deactivation of genes which are not necessary in the phenotype because the circumstances don't warrant it. This is adaptability of the genotype and has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. We of course can get variability by hybridization. Now in mammals it doesn't work so well. They tend to be infertile. Here's a liger, a cross between a tiger and a lion. Or you have a wolfen, a cross between a whale and a dolphin, a zonkey, a cross between a donkey and a zebra, a zorse, a cross between a horse and a zebra. And uh, being, of course, mammals, this is not necessarily viable in terms of the offspring, but in plants, in fishes, in insects, you could produce a great variety in terms of these things. Or you could get fusions of genetic material. Here's a tandem fusion, that's when you have a large chromosome fusing with a small acrocentric chromosome like you have over here, and then eventually creating this big chromosome on the right over here. Now is there any new information here? No, none. It's exactly the same information. The banding pattern shows exactly the same genes. It's just in another combination. Like you're pressing the keys on the piano in a different combination produces a different tune, so you can get a different tune here. So the elant has such a fusion. Notice the stripes and the shape of the horn. This is the largest antelope in the world. Notice the kudu. It also has the stripes and the twirled horns. Or the nyala, where the male and the female are so anatomically different that you would imagine they're two species if at first glance. Nevertheless, they have the same stripes, the same twirled horns. And if you look at the bongo, it also has the same genetic aberration, and if you look at one of the smaller antelopes, the Setatunga, it has the same. My question is this, is every single one of these a new species? I don't believe so. I believe this is one kind. This is variability within a kind. You know the scientific world has two kinds of taxonomists. The one is called a splitter and the other one is called a lumper. Now these are always arguing. Now, I was a comparative physiologist uh, when I did these things at university, and my colleagues fell into both of these categories. They were always arguing on this issue. The splitter, he likes to split everything into separate species. And the lumper says, no, 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 this is just variation within the gene pool. Well, let's go and lump a little more. And a kind, what does that represent? It doesn't represent the eelant, the sitatunga, the bonga, the whatever, the nyala, all of those are one kind with the built-in capacity to create everything that we have on this planet. The wolf is a beautiful example. It has well over 70 chromosomes, whereas the foxes range from in the 30s to the number that the wolf has. So if you do chromosome banding, you will find that if they are in the 30s, in the terms of the chromosomes, they're very long. And if they are in the 70s, then they're very short. But the banding patterns tell us that's the same story. So this creature has all the genes for the entire canid family. The fox has the same genes, the fox family, as the wolf, just in a different pattern of distribution. Nobody would deny that the dog race from the Afghan to little papillon down there is one species, because they know it's one species. When it comes to the wild type, the variation between the main wolf and the fennec is no greater than that of the single species, but each one is a separate species. I would like to go so far as to say that all of this is one kind. So how many went into the ark of all the wolves and jackals and all of these creatures on the planet? How many went into the ark? One pair. Here we have a jackal, a fox, and a coyote. 
three different species. In Canada, in central Canada, the wolf will pair with the large coyote. The large coyote will pair with the small coastal coyote. The wolf will not pair with the coastal coyote, but along the climb they all are interchangeable. So what are they? They're one kind. This makes the problem far less than what it would appear. Here we have a dingo and a dog. Now the problem with the dingo is that the dingo is going extinct. And there's great ooh, excitement about this in Australia. And uh, the dingo is a protected species. Now why is it going extinct? The dingo is going extinct because it mates with a dog. So what is the dingo? It's a dog. Nothing special about the dingo, it's a dog. In fact, the own writings of the Australians depict that these creatures came from Asian seafarers as their pets in the, in the past, and today they are wild. And because of evolutionary type thinking, this is a special species. It's a dog, it mates with a dog, it interbreeds with a dog, it's disappearing because it's being absorbed into the dog's gene pool. Here we have a transposable gene. Now a transposon is a gene which can be clipped out and inserted in another position. Absolutely precisely, as you clip one nucleotide too far, the gene sequence is nonsensical. The hatata, the hundata, the at, it means nothing. Now this can create rapid change. You can go from a small creature to a large creature within one generation just by clipping gene sequences, let's say for growth hormone, into a position that is read more often. So in other words, these are built-in mechanisms to create mega change. Question, how did they come into existence? You have two choices, chance or design. Because natural selection does not operate at the level of the genotype. It operates at the level of the phenotype. So let's look at the built-in mechanisms that we find in the gene pool. We have built-in variation in the gene pool. In other words, the wolf has everything from, from uh, the Chihuahua to the Great Dane built into that gene pool. Where do those genes come from? They come into existence by chance or design. Reproductive exchange. Where does this mega process of producing variety come from? It had to come about by chance or design. There's no natural selection involved in any one of these. Independent assortment during meiosis, a process that had to be established by chance or design. All of these are so complicated that the greatest minds in the world cannot comprehend even a fraction of what's going on. And yet we have the intellectual arrogance to say that they came about by chance. Crossing over during meiosis, a process highly complex, producing all the variants in the world out there, and nevertheless had to come about by chance. Recombination of chromosomes, transposable DNA, or even drastic rearrangements of DNA, which also don't imply new information, but just talk about old information rearranged in a different fashion. For example, naked mole rats under environmental stress will undergo drastic re rearrangements of their chromosomes in order to produce a more varied offspring. But the process itself had to come about by chance or design because it's genotype information. So if I were a modern day Darwin, armed with this information about the tremendous potential built into the gene pool that had to come about by the design of an intelligent being. And I came to, a, to an island and I found locks up over there and I saw all this variety. Would I say, oh, there's so much variety here, they obviously had a common ancestor, therefore there is no God. Or would I say, wow, look at this variety that the Creator has endowed the species with. It is phenomenal. Well, let's have a look at the human being. The debate that is raging. Which race is superior? One or the other. Let's look at the ladies. Ladies are always interesting to look at. And uh, 
Men, of course, are more beautiful, so I chose the more beautiful men of the world to show you their variety. And, uh, well, let's not start that debate. Let's go to family units and let's go to the little children. Now we are on safe ground. Which one of these is the evolutionary superior one now in the mindset? None of them. You see, each one of them is a product of the variety that God has put into the gene pool for us to appreciate. But we tend to place the one in a superior level and the other one at an inferior conjunction. You know, when we look at the creatures of the world, here are the variants of Drosophila. We have Drosophila with white eyes, Drosophila with red eyes, Drosophila with brown eyes, Drosophila with short wings, Drosophila with long wings, Drosophila with more than one wing pair, and all the varieties that you can imagine. These creatures have been bombarded with genetic change more than evolution could have produced over time. But all that has ever been produced is Drosophila, fruit flies. Variants of fruit flies, but fruit flies. So I would like to pose the question, if natural selection is a useless god that cannot create anything and only can make less and less, how do we account for this beautiful variety that we have? How do we account for all these complex processes out there? How do we account for irreducible complexity? How do we account for beauty, appreciation? We haven't even spoken about those things. How do we account for the transversion of what we see into an image in the mind? How do we account for appreciation and love? All of these virtues built in to each and every single one of us, it smacks of a designer. And as far as I'm concerned, me and my house, we will believe the Lord. Have things on earth always been the same as they are today? Join us next time as we put together the story from creation to restoration.